Now, let's just hold things right there for a second. I can't be the only one who first saw this cutscene and Chief hitting the nuke and then in the next scene seemingly being perfectly fine and unaffected and got significantly confused as to what exactly had taken place in those interim moments. I mean, for a brief moment the first time that I watched this, I actually genuinely thought that we had just watched Master Chief die and this was something approximating an afterlife or that he was in some sort of state of limbo before he would eventually move on to the, the divine beyond, I suppose. But with time has come wisdom, and as I've looked into the specifics of this event and the variables that were at play, so to speak, this scene now makes strikingly more sense than it originally did. But in order to make full sense of exactly what happened during this scene, you need to have a good grasp of, one, the type of nuclear device that was being used here, two, Cortana and her interface with the Master Chief and her processing speeds, and at least a superficial understanding of the properties of hard light. So in true Zero Zero fashion, you know, leaving no stone unturned so to speak, today we're going to be looking at this scene where Chief detonates the nuke and survives, and figure out exactly how that was possible. So, let's roll the intro. Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00, and today we're looking at the specifics of the event where Chief detonates the nuke at the end of Halo 4 to destroy the Mantle's approach and save Earth from composition. But more so than that, the fact that he actually survived activating a nuke by hand. So in order to get a good feel for exactly what's going on here, we need to break things down a little bit. So first things first, the nuke in question that Chief is using here is a Havoc tactical nuclear warhead, specifically the Mark 2556 MFDD, standing for Medium Fusion Destructive Device. Yes, you heard me right there, Medium Fusion Destructive Device. Which I would argue is a misnomer given that this particular nuclear device has a yield of 30 megatons. That's bigger than most nuclear devices we currently have in our arsenals. Admittedly, the SAR Bomber, or the mother of all bombs, is slightly larger than that. But given that the Havoc Tactical Nuke only measures 13.8 inches in length and approximately 7.5 inches in diameter, that's a hell of a yield for a device so small. I mean, it's small enough to effectively be carried on Master Chief's back. Now this specific variant of the Havoc Nuke is classed as an excavation grade Havoc Warhead, which means that it's presumably used in mining operations to excavate large quantities of soil quickly. Which is not to say that it can't be fitted inside of a missile housing so it can be used, for example, with the F-41 broadsword for ship-to-ship -ship purposes. This is, after all, where the Chief got the warhead from. Now, next we need to understand what kind of nuclear device it is, and as is the case with a lot of nuclear devices in use by the UNSC, this is a nuclear fusion device as opposed to a nuclear fission device. Fission being splitting a heavier atom into a lighter atom with the release of huge amounts of energy and a lot of radioactive material, while fusion, as the name implies, is fusing together lighter atoms like hydrogen into slightly heavier atoms such as helium with the release of immense levels of energy. Now the Havoc is actually a thermonuclear device which means it actually uses a fission reaction to ignite the fusion reaction. So it makes use of a chemical explosive that when detonates causes a fissionable material to undergo nuclear fission, splitting heavier elements into lighter ones, with the release of huge amounts of energy, and that explosive force is contained and directed towards the fusionable material, which in this case is a deuterium-tritium blend, both isotopes of hydrogen but with tritium carrying an extra neutron, meaning when they undergo fusion with deuterium, which is just a proton and a neutron in its core, the deuterium and tritium fuse into helium with the release of that one neutron, aiding to continue the process of fusion while also expressing huge amounts of energy. And once the fusion reaction takes place, it blasts through its housing with a huge thermonuclear explosion. So now, with that in mind, we have the Chief crouched down on the hard light bridge on Mandel's approach, taking one last lingering look at Earth, knowing full well what happens next will probably be his final act. He looks down to the Havoc nuke and he strikes the detonator. Now we have to look at Cortana, 
Now at this point Cortana was actually within the systems of the mantle's approach and as we well know from this cutscene she had shed her numerous rampant fragments into the systems that then all took form on the light bridge made of hard light itself. For the first time in Cortana's entire life she was an actual physical being. This is why after this cutscene she walks up to the chief and actually sets a hand upon his armour. It's the first time she's ever been able to actually touch him. Whereas if she did it before it would just be chief touching a hologram. There's nothing there. It's just light. Now of course we need to bear in mind that the reason that Chief did survive this particular event is because of Cortana. Now she is an artificial intelligence, moreover she's a smart artificial intelligence, which means her potential is almost unlimited, but that does come with a shortened 7 year lifespan because eventually AIs think themselves to death. In Cortana's case at this point she was actually 8 years old outliving the life expectancy of other AIs, probably because she was isolated from the rest of humanity and the UNSC during the years that elapsed while John was still in cryo, but also likely helped in no small part by the fact that Halsey actually allowed her to shed huge amounts of the information that she absorbed from the Halo when she was on it, which likely bought her some breathing room, and the fact that she was produced in a way that is rather unique for smart AIs, in that she was actually created from the cloned brain of Dr. Halsey, and it was a still living brain. Whereas normal smart AIs are usually made from the brains of recently deceased hosts. In either case, the punchline here is that Cortana is extremely advanced for an AI. I've also done a video relatively recently where I looked at AIs and how they're information and data processing systems work and the fact that humanity should be significantly more advanced because of the advantage of having AIs working with us. And in that video I made the calculations to find out that effectively an AI processes information and perceives things at the speed of light because that is the speed that the information and data moves through the crystalline substrate that is the AI's Riemann matrix, an AI's quote unquote brain. While in comparison a living human, the signals move through our brains via electrochemical processes at a maximum velocity of approximately 120 meters per second. Which while it sounds like it's fast, when you compare it to an AI, there's absolutely no comparison to be made. AIs can think a million times faster than a normal human being. And finally we need to get a feel for what hard light is. Hard light is a forerunner technology that's more formally identified as a boson photon field. The specifics of how the foreigners achieved this is still hotly debated, but it involves in some degree the interaction between high energy light and gas particles within the environment, using sophisticated quantum fields to strip the gas particles and the light of their electron fields, rendering them solid. And when I say solid, the physics that are at play with something like hard light are so pronounced and so powerful that even the detonation of nuclear devices doesn't seem to adversely affect them unless the power supply is damaged in the process. Foreigners most recognisably use hard light for the purposes of creating light bridges, as it is in this particular case where Chief, the Didact and Gontana are on a light bridge aboard the mantle's approach. But foreigners also use hard light as physical building mechanisms and structural reinforcements. The bridges themselves, while they have a ghostly blue hue, doesn't mean that all hard light has that appearance. Some hard light can be rendered to look like any material one could imagine, since the very properties of the visual appearance of a material are simply based on the manner of which light reflects, refracts or is absorbed by a respective surface so hard light can be made to look like any material because it is itself light and it's just simply the manipulation of the way in which the light at the surface of the hard light structure appears to an observer. I bring this up because I want to use it as an example that hard light is an extraordinarily resilient material. There were spokes of hard light on all of the halos, there were spokes of hard light on the Zeta halo when it was still the larger 30,000 kilometer diameter and the halo had to be reorientated to allow a planet to pass within the circle of the halo without damaging the ring, using these hard light spokes to reinforce the halo so that the immense gravitic tidal forces wouldn't tear the halo apart. So now we have the three major aspects of this particular recipe fleshed out. We now understand the Havoc tactical nuke. 
we understand Cortana and her speed of processing and how unique of an AI she is, and we understand Hardlight. And the last thing we need to understand is just how fast a nuclear detonation happens. Now, even in the Havocs case, where it is a thermonuclear device where it uses a chemical explosion to ignite a fission explosion to ignite the fusion explosion before properly detonating, even with that quite lengthy process, it all happens in 10 milliseconds. Basically a tenth of a second. For all intents and purposes from our lowly human perceptions, it is instant. The second the button is pressed, and the electrical signals are sent through the circuits at the speed of light, the chemical explosion ignites. A split second later, the force from that explosion ignites the fission explosion, and a split second later, it ignites the fusion explosion, and a split second later, the bomb explodes. That means at the moment the chief battle cries and slams his hand into the activation button of the Havoc nuke, Cortana had 10 milliseconds to respond to save the chief's life. She had to wait for chief to actually make contact with the detonator button because had she had acted too soon, he wouldn't have physically been able to make contact with it. He would have been blocked and prevented by what she did next. So she needed to wait for his hand to physically engage the button and for the signals to begin to be sent through the circuitry of the Havoc nuke. And at that moment, Cortana kicked into action. And what she then did was manipulate the hard light of the bridge that Chief was kneeling upon, that she, in truth, at this point, was made of herself. She manipulated the hard light and slithered it around underneath Chief's grip between his hand and the nuclear device, separating him from the Havoc nuke as it's still undergoing the process of detonation and encapsulating him in a hard light bubble, so tough that the nuclear explosion, even at point-blank range, wouldn't have been able to penetrate the hard light. And within a tenth of a second, Cortana had successfully separated the Master Chief from an explosion that would have destroyed him. The Havoc nuke detonated with the yield of 30 megatons, and at point-blank range with Chief directly next to the vector of detonation, he was wrapped in a hard light shield, safe from the detonation. Now this is where things get really interesting. At this point, the mantle's approach had been destroyed, which means the source of power for the hard light structure that Cortana had created, the light bridge, was no longer there. Which means by rights, the hard light structure that Chief is within, following this explosion, should no longer be in existence. Now in a recent video where we looked at Chief's reaction time when he was first testing out his Mark V platform, we highlighted the fact that in peak capacity, particularly when in tandem with an artificial intelligence, Spartans can perceive things so incredibly quickly that they actually experience time dilation. That is exactly what is happening in this instant. It is the only explanation that is valid in the fact that this hard light construct is still in existence after the ship that it was projected from had been utterly destroyed. The only way that this hard light is still in existence following this is that this is happening in split seconds immediately after the explosion. Now why don't we see fire and brimstone outside of this hard light bubble? Well, because nuclear devices when they're detonated in space don't react the same as they do when they detonate in an atmosphere. And in truth, we shouldn't discount the idea that perhaps this hard light bubble had actually been thrown free of the mantle's approach at the instant of explosion, and that it's just the residual energy that is allowing this hard light bubble to continue to exist for the moments thereafter. In either case, it seems relatively likely that in these moments, in this final farewell between the Master Chief and Cortana, this fairly drawn out process of saying goodbye, this moment where Cortana makes the first physical contact with the chief that she's ever been capable of and ever will be capable of, all happens within the split seconds following the explosion itself. And when Cortana finally says, welcome home, John, 
and fades into the background. It's not because she's choosing to leave, it's because that the energy that sustains the hard light bubble and her form itself is now finally dissipating. Only a few moments following the explosion that Cortana saved the chief from. Now, I don't know about you, but the emotional tone of this scene, this selfless sacrifice that the chief undergoes, followed instantly by the selfless sacrifice of Cortana to protect and save the chief's life, followed by this bittersweet goodbye, was a hugely emotionally impactful moment. And the fact that this entire process happened likely over a few moments, perhaps even only a few seconds, with Chief perceiving Cortana's presence that much quicker due to the adrenaline and his interaction with Cortana at that moment, does actually elevate the scene to being almost spiritual. Because this entire scene takes place in a strange time dilation effect instants after a nuclear explosion and likely only lasted a second at most makes this final farewell feel like it happened in limbo. And yet in those few moments, Chief and Cortana got to say goodbye. They didn't want to say goodbye. They didn't want to leave each other. But their very connection gave them the time they needed to come to terms with their new reality. For Cortana to accept her mortality and for Chief to swallow the fact the Cortana was gone. And until next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider smashing the like button and leave a comment below on what you'd like me to cover next. Big shout out to my patrons Spartan10148, the Metarch of my installation, Falcon, Prophet Bear, Mikhail, Sophia, and Ashley, my dutiful monitors, Darian, Scarab, Spartan0137, Anthony, Ghost, Aaron, Chris, Jacob, Sean, Element0, Somatic, Jordan, J3, Dan, Mr. Keys, Directal, Gunslinger, Jacob, Bandmill, Echo, Evermore, Officer Cat, and Personal Devil, my diligent submonitors, my fleet of Strato Sentinels, and my loyal enforcers. And all the other patrons who have jumped aboard to support the channel, it means more to me than I can accurately put into words. Another shout out to my Tier 0 Transcendent YouTube members, Spartan137, Jacob, Schmitty, Talia, Fenrir, and Born Stella. And all the other YouTube members, keeping my installation running on that glorious vacuum energy. Shout out to John for, I don't fucking know. And if you want more of this kind of content, hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. And consider jumping aboard yourself as a patron or YouTube member to keep the channel alive and kicking. Thanks again for watching. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain. <laughs>